It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew Howe. Dr. Howe leads the Supernova Group at Las Cumbres Observatory Global Telescope Network, is adjunct professor in Department of Physics at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and was a host of the National Geographic Channel series, Known Universe. He is a co-author of more than 100 scientific papers, including 10 in the journals Nature and Science. He's been instrumental in the discovery of several new classes of supernovae, including explosions brighter and dimmer than previously thought possible. He's also helped to produce the best current measurements of the properties of dark energy. This followed his work with the Supernova Cosmology Project, whose leader, Saul Pol Pol sorry, Perlmutter, was awarded the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics, along with Brian Schmidt and Adam Rees for the discovery of the acceleration of the universe. He also has a secret second life as an accredited journalist writing film reviews under the name Copernicus on the site Ain't It Cool News. And in his free time, he's been known to get into boxing matches with NASA conspiracy theorists. Dr. Andrew Howell. Thank you. All right. So if it's not obvious, that, that's me. That's the NASA conspiracy theorist, OK? So uh, people like to say there's no such thing as a dumb question. But if you ask a dumb question later, I'm going to come punch you in the face, OK? So pay attention. There'll be a quiz. All right, so it's great to be here on, uh, interestingly enough, uh, day after July 4th. So July 4th is Hate Britain Day. But uh, I guess today is Love Britain Day, OK? so. So first, I want to tell you a little bit about Las Cumbres Observatory. What is this? So we're building a network of telescopes all around the Earth. So we've just finished our southern ring of telescopes. It's two-meter telescopes and one-meter telescopes. And, um, uh, and we put them all around so that we can always have telescopes in the dark. Um, so just to show you that, uh, it's one thing to say that, but to see why we need to do that, Here's actual data from the MESSENGER mission as it was going to Mercury. It had to fly by the Earth. And when it did, it took these pictures of the Earth. And these are real pictures. It, it looks computer generated, but it's real. So here it is um, flying away from the Earth. So you can see the Earth is spinning, right? And there are clouds. But the other thing you see is there's the nighttime. And the problem with telescopes is you put, put it in one site, and then you're interrupted by daylight, and you can't keep observing. So if we put telescopes all around the Earth, there's always some dark somewhere. So we built this global uh, robotic telescopes of network. So it's always dark somewhere. So our motto is, uh, we keep you in the dark. Uh, or sometimes we say, the sun never rises on the LCOGT empire. Uh, but we're trying to study supernovae and dark energy. That's what I do. And then th discover extrasolar planets. And then you know, maybe find those asteroids that might come kill us and stuff like that. OK, so here's a supernova that we uh, discovered in, 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 in our group. And uh, it was with the closest type 1a supernova in 25 years. And that's actually relevant to Doctor Who in, in some way. OK, so uh, you might know the Eye of Harmony. It's what uh, powers the Time Lords uh, on Gallifrey. But uh, it's a star frozen in the process of collapse into a black hole. OK, and there's actually one in the TARDIS, because you know the TARDIS is infinite on the inside. So uh, they go and see it. There's, sometimes they say it's a copy, or it's not clear if it's the real thing, or what, how you can have a star in the TARDIS, but whatever. It's powering the TARDIS. And it is a, a core collapse supernova. OK, like, this is very cool. Because a core collapse supernova is a star like 10 times the size of the sun, or bigger. And it's after a star finishes its normal life, and it runs out of fuel. It puffs up to be really big. But then down in the core, it's like really tiny down in the core. It's actually at the end of its life, it's, it's burned every, all kinds of fuels it can burn. And it's a, in a normal star, the burning of the fuel is what's holding it up against collapse. There's this struggle between gravity trying to collapse it and then pressure keeping it up, the pressure from all of the nuclear burning. It's kind of like a, a car tire where it's the air pressure keeping it up against gravity. Uh, when you run out of fuel, it collapses and then gets incredibly dense, so dense that you create a neutron star or a black hole, and it bounces and creates a supernova. So you can calculate the energy of this really easily. It's just the binding energy of the stellar core, and that's like 10 to the 46 joules. 
And to give you an example of what that is, a watt is about, uh, a, it is exactly a joule per second. And you know, like a 100 watt light bulb is putting out 100 joules a second. This is one with 46 zeros behind it, joules. So unimaginable amounts of energy. So could you actually use it to power your civilization? Uh, I think you could. So uh, in uh, 2011, like the world's energy consumption was like five times 10 to the 20 joules. Uh, so a supernova could power the Earth's current civilization for 10 to the 25 years, okay? And the age of the universe is only 1.4 times 10 to the 10 years. So uh, over the age of the universe, the civilization could use 10 to the 36 joules every year, uh, or 10 quadrillion times what we're using. Okay, so even if the, the uh, I guess the uh, Gallifreyans, they don't have to be very green, they have like infinite energy, okay? They can just do, do whatever they want. Uh, so, like, how does how does a supernova compare to other compare to other power sources? Well, you can you can read it in the table there. But basically, even if you created another copy of the Earth and annihilated it with antimatter, like it was an antimatter Earth, and it runs into an Earth, you still don't get as much energy as you get out of a supernova. Okay, and it can shine brighter than every other star in a galaxy shining at once. Okay, and temporarily it can outshine the power of all the other stars in the universe. So it's an incredible amount of power. Okay, so here below are some supernovae and they're the little blue dots and things, the white dots uh, in their host galaxy. So they're almost as powerful as their whole galaxy. Okay, so that's a cool bit of science. Uh, but uh, now let's get to time travel. Okay, so uh, here is a very fun uh, diagram that I didn't make, I found on the internet about time travel and movies. Okay, and there are a lot of uh, your, your favorite movies and interesting things in here, but what you'll see is there are so many different ways to handle time travel. And Doctor Who has a sort of set of ways of doing it, but it's been around for 50 years, so they've done them all, almost, right? They just, they just whatever, they, somebody has a good idea, they just do it. They don't worry too much about sticking to the rules. So uh, just to hit a couple of uh, points here, there's things like the multiverse, okay, or there's things like the Nabokov self-consistency principle. There's things like backward world lines, okay? Uh, and all kinds of things like, can you travel to the past? Is there a single timeline? Can you meet yourself, et cetera? I can't remember where some of these things are. Okay, uh, so by the end of this talk, you should understand all of this, okay? So uh, it, it'll come back up at the end. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quiz, okay? So let's get started. Uh, first, uh, our concept of time has changed. So first of all, I'm going to give some of the science of what do we actually know about time and is time travel possible? Okay, uh, it's, it's changed really profoundly. So in ancient times, it was defined by astronomical phenomena because, you know, it's the Earth spinning around on its axis a day, right? The moon going around makes uh, a month. That's how we get our name for month, moon, right? Uh, and then... Of course, the orbit of the Earth is a year, and then the seasons also, as the, as the Earth goes around one quarter each time. And so this is really important to know this stuff, to be able to plant your crops and everything like that on time. So astronomy was really important to the ancient world for, for timekeeping, and so like time was actually done with sundials, and every city had its own local noon that was set by when the, the, the sun was overhead. Okay, but when we got to the Industrial Revolution, they, f uh, they had a problem, because trains are going city to city, and so you had to keep time within cities. And the same thing with the telegraph. Uh, now you could communicate between cities. And it actually took a long time, maybe 40 years or so, before people realized this problem. Actually, trains uh, would run into each other and kill people. This, this happened a few times uh, because they, didn't have the, they weren't keeping the same time. Okay? They were supposed to, but they didn't. And so people realized, I mean, people were really reluctant to keep the same time. And then they finally just did. Okay? So that was the, the you know, the way it was for, for many years, but now our modern conception is that we have relativity. Time is not even absolute. So two different people actually can have different concepts of time, and, and they're both, I mean, they're, they're really, they're keeping different times, okay? There is no one time in the universe. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, relativity. Uh, you're all gonna learn how to be relativists, okay? You're gonna learn some relativity. So uh, it's not that hard. Um, okay, so this is our, our Adding, how to add velocities with our monkey brains. Okay, our, our brains evolved like at low speeds, you know, here on Earth. So we didn't evolve to understand relativity. Uh, uh, we evolved to understand 
stuff that happens at slow speeds when relativity is not important. So if a ball is hit at you at 30 meters per second and you're in the outfield running towards it at 10 meters per second, the relative difference that you see is 40 meters per second. In other words, that ball looks like it's coming at you 10 meters per second faster because you're moving towards it, okay? But if it, the, you're talking about the speed of light, that's totally different. L light is traveling at the speed of light, which we call C, okay? Three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So you're an astronaut shining a flashlight, and now you're, you're another, there's another astronaut in a ship coming towards it uh, at, say, a third the velocity of the speed of light. So under the Newtonian description, the old one, uh, you would think that the speed, the relative speed, would be 1.33 c, c plus one third c. But according to Einstein, no, that is totally wrong, okay? The velocity is always seen as c. You always see light moving at the same speed, okay? Now that is wacky, wacky stuff. So some weird stuff has to happen for that to be true. Because you can imagine, like, what happens if you're moving really close to the speed of light, like, beside a light wave, and you look over and look at the light wave? Like, what if you're, like, 0.99C and you look at the light wave? You, should, you would think it would be creep, it would just be barely edging ahead of you. But no, you still see it at C. So what has to happen is length has to contract on the direction of travel, and time actually slows down. Okay, so to keep the speed of light the same, uh, time is relative. Different observers measure different times. So uh, here's the formula. Uh, I won't go through it, but basically it's, uh, it's not that hard to figure out. It's just v squared over, over c squared. And that, that tells you exactly how time uh, differs. So if you have a clock moving, uh, the moving clock ticks off one second here. And on the bottom part of the graph, we have the speed relative to you. So as we get close to the speed of light here, c, the speed that you, I mean, the, the number of ticks your clock shows goes way up. So you, it might take your clock five ticks and the other clock is only taking uh, one tick. Okay, so this is actually happening, okay? Like time travel is really happening in this way in the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. Okay, it's a giant uh, particle accelerator, okay, that, that accelerates particles in this huge loop up to like 99% of the speed of light and so, for example, pi mesons that ought to self-destruct after 25 billionths of, the, of a second don't because their clock is running slow, okay? They last 30 times longer than they should, okay? So this is, this relativity has been confirmed over and over again. Oh, and to see the scale of this, I should say that there's a person right there, right? And then this is, this is part of the unfinished thing, and this thing stretches for like 16 miles around, okay? It's, it's amazing. Okay, so... Uh, so if you can go close to the speed of light, you can, your time will go slower. So uh, this leads to things like, you might have heard the twin paradox. If you send one astronaut out, uh, traveling close to the speed of light, they're twins, they're the same age, the, the, the moving one's uh, time will go, go slower for the one going close to the speed of light. Okay, so if you can imagine building like a train around the Earth that just orbited the Earth at near the speed of light, you could get in it, Go, go close to the speed of light, get out, and it would be like, it might have only been like five years for, for you, but it might have been like 100 years on Earth, okay? So depending on how fast you were going. So in that sense, time travel is possible. Okay, so uh, now there's another uh, concept uh, that relativity teaches, and that's the equivalence principle. So here was uh, Newton and Einstein dropping an apple in an elevator. Okay, one sitting on the Earth, the apple is just due to gravity, and the other one is moving up in space, and he drops the apple. And you can't see, from inside the elevator, you can't tell the difference, okay? You can't tell if you're on a planet or if you're in an elevator moving, okay? And that is a very profound thing. That says that it, it, it's the same, gravity and uh, moving, okay? So that tells us something quite profound. It says that since everything responds to gravity independent of the mass, so a photon would, be, would have a curved path because of your acceleration, but that means gravity must do it too. And since photons are massless, that means that this stuff has to be a property of space itself. So space-time. So time and space are interrelated in something we call space-time. And it, it, this is a representation up above there of the Earth like representing space-time as two dimensions. 
uh, gravity produces a dimple in space-time, and so you can think of the, the moon just like orbiting around in that well there, that potential well of the Earth. So space and time are, are wrapped up, and so really the world is not three-dimensional like the three spatial coordinates, it's four-dimensional where time is another coordinate. Okay, so differential distances are measured as ds squared equals dx squared, dy squared, dz squared, that, so that's like the difference in x, y, and z, then with an extra term, minus c squared dt squared, and dt is difference in time. So if I wanna make my coordinates, let's say I'm standing here, right, and I move over here, now you would think the distance that I just traveled is, is whatever, a few feet, right? But no, it's actually, you have to take time into account when you're doing these equations. And so I actually have something called a world line, which we'll talk about in a second. So Einstein basically teaches us to, to, to think in this way Okay, here's a very simple uh, description of, of world lines where x, we'll, we'll just make all the spatial dimensions x for this top part here. Okay, so that's just any distance, so just like me moving this way, that's, I'm moving in, in x, okay? And the top axis is time. Okay, so that's another coordinate. So as time goes up, as I'm moving to the right here, uh, I'm moving this way and I'm moving up in time. Okay, so a slow object is gonna do like this and a very fast object is gonna go like that, right? So I trace out some, what's called a world line and if I'm moving, this is for like a constant velocity, but if I start accelerating, I'm gonna have a different path in this, in this uh, axis here. Now you can turn it into a 2D representation of space, so now this is just two-dimensional space, and then this whole plane is moving up over time. So speed of light makes uh, an angle here in the, in, the, uh, in the, it's called a light cone, and now since things can't go faster than the speed of light, you can only access things inside this light cone. Okay, if you can, if you can only go uh, slower than the speed of light. Okay, but in uh, time travel stories, in most time travel stories, they uh, collapse the world line to one dimension instead of being a four-dimensional thing, and they just make a timeline, and you can go anywhere in that timeline. But that's not the way it would actually work because you actually have a world line. So when I was here, I was here. Right? But when I was over there, I was over, uh, back in time, I was over here. So you really have to take that into account. For example, if you could go back in time, you might go back in time and the Earth is just somewhere else in its orbit, okay? and you'd miss the Earth. Okay? But in Doctor Who, they take that into account by having the TARDIS. All right? So uh, I think there's some TARDIS fans in the audience. In fact, I saw some people dressed up as the TARDIS. So the TARDIS might be here tonight, actually. Um, so uh, anyway, the TARDIS, it's, it's bigger on the inside, as we all know, uh, and it, it, it can traverse time and space. So usually it dematerializes and rematerializes. So it can take into account this fact that, that we have to move in space and time, okay? But sometimes they do show it just flying through space. So it can just fly through space if it wants to. You know, it can just do whatever. It's, uh, it's the ultimate spaceship. Okay, but reality itself may even have more dimensions. So it may have like 11 dimensions. String theory, uh, most uh, conceptions of string theory have like 11 dimensions, okay? 10 plus one, where one is time. Uh, but the uh, extra dimensions are only relevant on small scales, okay? It's so another concept, the time vortex in Doctor Who, okay? So this is what the, tr the TARDIS travels through. Uh, and it's, it's said to be outside of time and space. Uh, so this is what you see at the beginning of uh, Doctor Who, you know, it's like, you know, whatever, like, right? Uh, that's what this is. they're showing you the time vortex. That's what the music that plays inside the time vortex, apparently. Uh, so even though in space there's no sound in the time vortex, there's that music. So, uh, so it's it's said to be outside of time and space. Normal physics don't work. Uh, e equals mc cubed. What? That cannot be possibly be right. I mean, come on. Like the units don't work out. But whatever. That's just to tell you that it is weird out there in the time vortex, okay? So weird that if you open the door, you might shrink to the size of an inch, okay? That is very problematic for operating your TARDIS. Uh, or if you're exposed to the time, you, you could be exposed to time winds which age everything, okay? And uh, if this TARDIS is a rockin', don't come and look at this thing about making babies, okay? <laughs> It is, I, I know this is a, uh, you know, I'm not gonna get too explicit here because this is a mixed uh, age crowd, but in, in, in the uh, show, I, I don't wanna give away any spoilers either, but, uh, 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 well, 
let's just, you, all, you already know this anyway. I don't know yeah, who I'm kidding. Yeah, you guys have all seen those stuff. Okay, so if Amy, Amy and, and Rory have a baby, right? And the baby, because it was conceived in the, in the time vortex, has Time Lord DNA. At least that's what she tells everybody. Uh, she's in there with a Time Lord that she's clearly attracted to, and the baby comes out with Time Lord DNA, and she tells, she tells her husband, oh, it must be because of the time vortex, you know? It's, it's like if you, um, you know, uh, a white couple, you know, the, the woman has a, an African-American baby, and then she, and the husband's like, what? It's She's like, well, we, we were, when we conceived him, we were in Jamaica, so it's, <laughs> it's, so, I, I don't know if I believe Amy Pond is all I'm saying, but, or, Time Vortex is just weird, though. Okay. All right. So, uh, back to some physics. Okay, the way we physicists talk about this is what we call closed time-like curves, because we like to make things sound really hard, nerdy, okay? Uh, it, and that's in this time thing. If, you, if, you're, if, you're cur if your curve just doesn't keep going straight up, it can connect. Uh, and, that's a, that, and so these are real things, uh, well, it, mathematically at least. Solutions exist to the equations of general relativity that allow the world line of a particle to return to its starting point in space-time. And if that's true, I mean, these are mathematical solutions. Okay, we don't know if reality can achieve it, but equation-wise, you know, hey, looks like it could work. <laughs> so this would allow time travel. Okay, so one, there's lots of different solutions, but one is traversable wormholes, okay? Okay, also known as an Einstein-Rosen bridge. That's what they call them in Thor, just to make them sound extra nerdy, okay. Um, okay, so like, uh, it's like a black hole, but it connects two points in space-time. So it could bridge two universes or two points in the same universe. Okay, so remember our little gravity-distorting thing here where the space-time is two-dimensional? Oh, but if, you, if it's not just a planet down here, there's a throat. If you can prop it open, you can come out somewhere. Okay, and so to keep it open requires some exotic matter with negative energy density. Okay, we don't know if there's stuff like this that exists, but it could. Okay, like, some, like the Casimir effect is this effect that I don't want to go into, it's too technical, but where you get two plates together and it seems like there's this extra force drawing them together and that has negative energy uh, density. So because that exists, maybe something like this could exist. Okay. Now, to turn it into a time machine, all you have to do is, okay, we're starting at the bottom here, we have two wormhole, we have the wormhole uh, with two throats, okay, and we take one of them and we accelerate it out close to the speed of light, so we're doing that twin paradox thing, okay, and then we bring it back close to, close to the other thing, okay, now time is moving slower in this mouth of the hole, this is, this is true, this actually works out mathematically, okay, because it, it has to do the way time connects through the two holes. So now what you can do is go in one hole, okay, let's take x here, uh, and uh, let's see, you go in here, okay, and uh, you, you come out here at six, you go in here, okay, then you actually come out at five, okay, and then you see yourself going into the hole, and then you could kill yourself and then not do it, so there's a paradox, right? So, uh-oh, so this is a serious question, okay, well, what if, you know, physics says we, maybe we could do this, but then now, I don't know how physics is gonna deal with this paradox, and so, how we do it is called the Novikov self-consistency principle. And that is, so uh, a guy uh, named Joel Pachinsky, who's in my department, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a nice guy, he's, uh, I've been on committees with him, he, he came up with, okay, let's take, um, let's take, uh, you know, like the uh, human thought out of the equation here, consciousness, okay, and we'll make it with billiard balls. Okay, so if you have a billiard ball that basically is gonna fall into a hole what would happen, what, what would happen if the, when the ball came out, it knocked into itself and prevented itself from going in the hole? Okay, but the, the Navikov self-consistency principle says, well, what has to happen is the ball has to hit itself and still go in the hole, so that it always hit itself in the first place. Okay, now that's, that really screws with your head, but so you, there's, there's basically a family of solutions uh, where the ball will still, it, 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 so in other words, time, We'll, uh, physics won't allow time travel that doesn't obey this. And so as long as this is obeyed, you don't get a paradox and maybe everything is cool. Okay, who knows? But okay, so the movie version is like 12 Monkeys where no matter what they do, 
they can't alter the past. Okay, so they're trying to, there's this virus. They don't even go back and try to, to not make the virus outbreak happen. They're like, we can't do anything with that. We're now just looking for clues and things to, to fix it in our present. Okay, so this gets into uh, a trope, which is a TV trope. So like this website, tvtropes.org, is pretty good. I, I got a lot of these, these ideas from, from some of uh, this place. Uh, and okay, so the most like the uh, Nabokov self-consistency principle is the like, you've already changed the past. So in Back to the Future, Marty plays Johnny B. Good, but uh, Chuck Berry gets the idea by listening on the phone. Okay, so presumably that's like how it always worked in that universe. Or maybe it didn't the first time, but then it did. Okay. So the outcome is the same, or he inspires busboy uh, Gordy Wilson to go into politics. In, he was already in politics in the, in the original timeline. Or in Bill and Ted, uh, they plant items in the past to help them out just when they need it at the big fight with the villain. So does the villain. But then uh, since only the winner can change history, the villain's props were put there by Bill and Ted to give them a false sense of security. Okay. So uh, all right. So that's, that's one way of, of dealing with time travel. But a, a related thing is called ontological inertia. Okay, I love that, that title. Okay, it's, like the, the, it's also related to the law of reality conservation or uh, you can't change the past. Okay, and that is that you, you can't completely undo something that exists or sometimes you can change the past, but coincidentally something will happen to make the original outcome happen. Okay, so time is like a river. You can drop a rock in it, some new event, but history will just flow around it, okay. So uh, that's like in Terminator, okay, in the, in the first three Terminator movies, good Terminator androids, bad Terminator androids, and one human are sent back in time to either prevent the upcoming apocalypse or kill off the future leader of the human rebellion. As each successive movie shows, attempts to change the future by either side will inevitably fail as long as there exists a demand for more Terminator movies, okay. <laughs> so. Uh, I mean, they even let a nuclear weapon go off. I mean, they even let the whole bad ne badness happen. So, I mean, you know, I liked that part of the movie. Okay, and then <laughs> killing Hitler. Okay, this is what everybody with a time machine wants to do. Okay, and there are so many ways to deal with this. This is going to be a theme. Okay, so the guys start off there. Basically, well, you can read the, uh, the thing. And, you know, he says, oh, you got to kill Hitler. You got a time machine go do it, and he's like, eh, I want to do some other stuff, okay, I'll fine, I'll go, go do him, and then he goes, and he's like, oh, he was in a bunker, you know, like, uh, you know, whatever, so it's like, uh, okay, you, you, you killed Hitler, I mean, he was already going to kill himself, so that's this version of the, of the uh, Nabokov, uh, whatever the hell I just said, well, it was, uh, sorry, it's a, uh, uh, <laughs> trust me, I'm a scientist, uh, Nabokov self-consistency principle, it's, it's, okay, so that's, that's like a version of that, okay. All right, so, uh, but in Doctor Who, they have an explicit version of this, okay? Whereas implicit in these other things, in Doctor Who, there are time locks on things. This is how they get around, why does the Doctor just go back and save his whole race, okay? Beside the fact that he's really screwed over his whole race. But, I mean, if he wanted to save them, uh, he can't, because things are time locked, okay? It, and they're unreachable by time travel, except when they are, okay? When so, so that's just to make, all that is is to set up when the writers are like, oh, we can't do that. Oh, but we're just gonna do it, we have to do that. He's like, okay, but there's gonna be consequences, okay? So then, he's just gonna have to fix the consequences with his sonic screwdriver or something, you know, whatever. Okay, so the last great time war between the Time Lords and Daleks, yep, it's time locked, you can't do anything, more or less. Okay, so the opposite of you can't change the past is the butterfly of doom, okay? Don't do anything, don't touch anything. Sci-fi rule number one, you start messing with the past, you end up with monkeys ruling the future, okay? <laughs> anytime, anytime you go back and change something, uh-oh. Uh, this is like the chaos thing with the butterfly and you get hurricanes in South America or whatever, right? So uh, there's a Hitler-related version, which is Godwin's law of time travel. Any and all modifications to the timeline result in Hitler winning World War II, okay? <laughs> so uh, that is related to Godwin's law as an online discussion grows longer, the probability of comparison involving Nazis or Hitler approaches one, okay? Uh, and it's, it's corollary, as soon as you compare something to Hitler, the argument is over and you've lost it, okay? So you're supposed to just close the discussion thread at that point, because uh, it's done. There's no, you can't go any farther than that, okay? Uh, and this, this, this is, of course, has been done in movies, in uh, like Time Cop 2, okay? And uh, an Australian film, as time goes by, 
couldn't stop the Holocaust, got rid of Strasser, and this dumb painter named Adolf showed up and did it exactly the same way. Okay, so it's really hard to kill Hitler. Okay, there is also something known as Hitler's Time Travel Exemption Act, uh, which is if you tra travel to the past and try to kill Hitler, it won't work as intended. It may even backfire. So Hitler survived 42 real-life assassination attempts. Look it up, it's crazy. Uh, so it is really hard to kill Hitler, okay? Uh, and even if you're successful, you now have no reason to go back and kill him, so there's a paradox, okay? Uh, or I've seen some other stories where, like a, a, an awesome short story on the web about they try to kill Hitler, and then somebody has to be like every, they get mad at all the newbies like who have just now got their time machine and they all try to go back and kill Hitler the first thing. They have to send somebody back to kill the person trying to kill Hitler because it, if it turns out that they actually kill Hitler, like then there was no uh, Cold War and there's no space race and then time machines wouldn't have been invented. Or, so it would, kill a, it would create a paradox, you know. So there's another concept called the, that's made up for Doctor Who, the, the Blinovich limitation effect. Okay, not, not a real thing, but uh, it's that you can't cross your own timeline Okay, but there are some caveats, of course, uh, which is that time lords can meet humans out of order, but in general, time lords must meet each other in order. So like, uh, you know, the doctor and the master have to keep meeting each other and they can't just be like, oh, I'm gonna go surprise the doctor when he was two, you know? They, they have to keep both getting older or whatever, right? Uh, except it does, totally doesn't work with humans for whatever, uh, for whatever reason. Like, the time lords can interact with humans in different orders. Okay, except when the script calls for it, that, limi that limitation does it. Don't worry about it. Just don't, don't think. Don't. It's like, uh, okay, related, the first law of time, a time lord can't meet his former self, okay, uh, unless there's a Doctor Who reunion special coming up. So, you know, then, then of course, they get together and be like, oh, you're a lot older than I thought you looked, or, or whatever, you know. All right, so uh, an example of time-crossing badness. Here's a clip from Father's Day. Go to it, quick. too late now. By the time the ambulance got there, he was dead. He can't die on his own. Can I try again? That's the first you and me. It's a very bad idea, two sets of us being here at the same time. Just be careful if they don't see us. Wait till she runs off and he follows, then go to your dad. Oh God, this is it. to do anything you don't want to, but this is the last time we can be here. Rose, no! I did it. I saved your life. Hi, did you see the speed of it? Did you get his number? I really did it. You, you're alive. That car was going to kill you. Well, give me some credit. I could see it coming. I was going to walk under it, was I? I'm Rose. That's a coincidence. It's my daughter's name. <laughs> That's a great name. Good choice. Well done. Huh. Right, uh, better shift. I've got a wedding to go to. Is that Sarah Clark's wedding? Yeah, are you going? Yeah. You and your boyfriend need a lift. That paradox unleashed some like time-eating demons or something. I, I actually, they, they don't eat like time, they eat doctors, I think. So uh, that is bad. So don't go meet yourself, okay? 
Uh, sometimes it's just some energy that you can get rid of with a sonic screwdriver. Sometimes giant time demons. Okay. All right. That, as far as we know, is not based in physical reality. Uh, at least we haven't discovered any time demons so far. Okay. So, uh, but okay. Alternatives to a single timeline, many worlds. Uh, I think actually I don't have time to really go through this, so I'm going to skip talking about quantum mechanics. But let's just say that. Uh, sorry, too. You guys took too long to get in here. You know, it's not my fault. It's yours. No. So, so uh, anyway, they. Uh, so, re but basically, re it's a way to. Uh, it's a really valid uh, thing to get ri get around quantum mechanics. Uh, some tricky things in quantum mechanics, and there may well be multiple universes. Every time any decision, anything happens, any particle decay, anything. Uh, reality splits and there are multiple universes. So like the reality is just like a branching tree of universes. So uh, like in, there, there's a famous Star Trek episode where Worf goes uh, off and then he comes back and then there's all these enterprises with all these different timelines, okay? And so that, uh, now, Doctor Who tries to maintain a single timeline, but sometimes multi, this is called the multi-world interpretation of quantum mechanics slips in. And there's some references to like doctors being able to do that in the past, but like when there were lots of time lords, but uh, uh, now, Maybe not so much. OK. So now you should be able to understand this uh, diagram a little better. OK, we talked uh, only a little bit about the uh, multiverse here. But uh, uh, a lot of these things are handled in one universe with uh, two timelines. Uh, or you, we know about the Nabokov self-consistency principle. OK, can you interact with yourself? Yes or no, right? Uh, and then down here, this is like, you know, what are the different uh, types of, of these things? And I, I, it's hard to read maybe on the screen there. Like, is your time travel by, you know, magical device or relativistic effects or a superpower, et cetera? Okay, so uh, I think they're going to put this talk online. So you can, you can stare at that uh, longer uh, if you feel like it or find it online yourself. Okay, and uh, lastly, uh, I, I think I'm not going to have time to, to show the, the clip from Blink, but we're showing Blink at 10, if you're still around and, 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 and have tickets, okay? It's my favorite episode of Doctor Who of all time, okay? So, uh, so, let's, uh, so let's skip the thing and say that, you know, when ultimately when the writers get confused, they can just say, eh, it's a Tommy Wimey ball, okay? It's, uh, it, it's here's the past, here's the future, it's wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. And basically, what you did while time traveling, yeah, it's all just mixed up in there. So that basically says, hey, uh, you know, the doctor, he knows what's going on. You're not quite smart enough to figure it out. But trust me, I'm the doctor. OK, that's it. <laughs> Thanks.